Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. I know you've been looking at myself and Pastor Jeff and Pastor Tyler online, but it's good to see you. Uh, We just wanted to remind you we are trying to maintain the social distancing, and we encourage you to wear your masks coming and going uh, whenever you're going to be facing towards someone particularly. And so just those few outlines. And at this time, I'm going to ask Pastor Jeff to come up and lead us in prayer. Hey, it's great to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. Um, Man, it's just nice to be out, isn't it? Get out, walk around, do something, be together. Um, Before I pray, I just want to let you know we do have the daily breads in, so they're on the back table as you go out. If you love to read the bread, uh, I like to eat bread personally, but if you like to read it, it's right here for you, a whole stack of them back there. Also, um, got some new gospel tracks in related to COVID-19, so it's creatively put together. People might be interested in reading that, and it has the gospel in there as well. That's on the back table as you go out. So um, why don't we go to prayer at this time? Thank you, God, for a chance for us to have fellowship together. Uh, Thanks for just uh, opening the door for us to allow us to be together and meet. Lord, uh, I pray that this this pause, this uh, 13 weeks or so off, has just created in us a real uh, yearning and a thirst to be in the presence of one another. Um, Lord, we've learned that the church um, is not a building. We realize that the church is a group of people uh, called by God to worship together in a local assembly. So thank you that we can be together and um, just talk to each other for a bit today. Lord, I pray that you would uh, just help the word to uh, be planted in our heart this morning, and we thank you again for your mercy and grace to us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning. I had to laugh at the 9 a.m. service because I had to move mic from here to here after Pastor Jeff prayed, so I thought that was pretty funny. Um, Two quick announcements really quick. The first is relating to youth group. Uh, Guys, our summer study is starting next week. Uh, The boys are going to be going through a study called Faithful Living, looking at the book of James, and the girls are are going to be going through a study called Women in the Bible. Amanda's going to be leading that study with the girls. Um, Really good opportunity for us to learn more about scripture and uh, We're hoping to try and start meeting in person as quick as we can, but for now we're going to start on Zoom. So um, girls and guys, be ready for some discussion questions we're sending to you this weekend, uh, ready for our series starting next week. Uh, Second announcement is today we are recognizing our 2020 graduates. Uh, So at this time, I'd like any high school or post-grad to please stand, and we will recognize you at this time. Let's give them a round of applause. You guys can be seated. Uh, We're going to pray for you, have a special prayer for you, and then afterwards we will have a video presentation uh, just recognizing you guys' um, pictures and uh, just more information about where these grads are in their life, what their next steps are, uh, and go from there. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for uh, our graduates. Thank you for guiding and directing them to this point in their lives. And uh, God, we just pray for their next steps. We pray for our high school grads that are going to college. And Lord, we pray for uh, your guidance and your direction for them and that they would continue to grow in you, that they would find local churches to uh, just get plugged into you and that they would serve and be served there. Lord, we pray for those that are... uh, Moving on and just going into the workforce, God, we pray that you would help them to be a light in their uh, situations, in their environments. Uh, And God, we're just thankful once again for your provision for them. I'm thankful for uh, them, and and we thank you and uh, recognize them today. In your name, I pray all these things. Amen.
as I started to say a little prematurely, a number of aspects of the service are abbreviated until we get back into the flow of things, but it is very good to be back, is it not? And it's so good to see your faces. Uh, most of us, what I have seen in the past, have been masks, and uh, masks don't do you justice. It's nice to see smiles again. At this time, Holly's going to sh- come and share a special with us, and then we'll continue with our service. <clears throat> looking for a song to sing when John called and asked if I could uh, sing. I shared this in the first service, so I'll share this again. I said, sure, I'll sing at the 11 o'clock service. And he said, Holly, we're having two services, 9 and 11, and you have to sing in both. I said, oh. So I made it through the 9, so I should be okay for the 11. Usually in the morning, my voice isn't what it needs to be. This is a song that I sang many years ago. I was 16 years old, so that is many years ago. I sang this as a competition song. I entered a competition in the church where we were attending, and um, it was a song that at 16, I thought it was a beautiful song. I liked the words. But the meaning of the words are much different now to me, and you'll hear these words as the years have gone by. And um, I sang in competition. I made it to the state finals through five different times. And then the states, two other girls beat me out. So that's okay. But I was just glad to sing and sing this for the Lord. And the name of this song is on Worthy. And it was written by Ira Stanfield. Some of you may know that name. He is an old songwriter. But the words he chose are just beautiful. Like, listen to that. I pray that you'll be blessed by this. the 
I'd like to encourage you to continue in prayer for the Earl Red family and Betty Doak family and remember them before the Lord. Earl and Betty have gone home to be with the Lord and I'm jealous. Would you bow with me please? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. As we look to your word this morning, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts to the things that you have for us. And we thank you, Father, that we're able to be here together this day after so long apart. And we pray your blessings upon us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome back to Abundant Life Baptist Church on this Lord's Day morning. It is so very good to actually see you. I know that you've been looking at other faces, myself, Pastor Jeff, and others uh, over the past few months, but we get to see you today. I'd like to thank you for coming, and we are continuing with the social distancing, and we're asking you to wear your masks coming and going, uh, just to try to keep everybody safe. And I'd also like to thank everyone who has made it possible for the uh, messages online, uh, all the work that's been done, uh, Kim particularly for editing those, and also Gail for providing Sunday school lessons, and Pastor Jeff for his blogs and, uh, and messages. So uh, we've been learning how to do some new things, uh, especially for this old dog, uh, but we're getting there. And so, again, it's good to have you back with us. Our text this morning is Psalm 122, verse 1. And the author writes, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, when most people see the phrase, the house of the Lord, they tend to think about the tabernacle in the wilderness and the three temples that were built in Jerusalem. And in point of fact, they are partly correct because the Hebrew word for house is the word by it, and it has also been translated as temple, tabernacle, dwelling, and palace. In much the same way, people today refer to this building as the church uh, or God's house. They're also partly correct in the same sense. As the house of the Lord, uh, it's to understood the place where God's presence is, where he dwells or abides. But I say partly correct because we often tend to identify the building that we see with the God that we cannot see and forget that the building is for our benefit, not for God's. When you think about the tabernacle in the wilderness and the three temples that were built in Jerusalem, they were laid out according to God's instructions. But this was not to provide a place for God to dwell as if he were homeless, 
but a place where God could manifest himself before his people, where he could identify with them and they could identify with him. Solomon understood that, and we read in 1 Kings 8, verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. Again, we read Solomon's word in Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 6. But who is able to build him a temple, since heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain him? Who am I then that I should build him a temple except to burn sacrifice unto him? Now, if you think back to the temple worship in the Old Testament... There were a great many sacrifices that were done there. There were also other aspects of worship. And we see Solomon touch on that aspect of it, of the tabernacle and the temple, as a place to worship the Lord. But as magnificent and glorious as the tabernacle and the temples were, they were not permanent. And one by one, they were destroyed by Israel's enemies. And when we think about the temples, we tend to identify them with people rather than the Lord. For example, we talk about Solomon's temple and and the incredible investment in time and treasure and talents, the materials, the workmen that were involved in actually creating that temple and building it, the precious metals and jewels and various exotic woods that were part of the construction. But Solomon's temple, for all its glory, was defiled and plundered and destroyed. The second temple was built after the people were led into captivity. This was in the time of Zerubbabel, and it was also eventually destroyed as well. But when it was completed, the old men who had seen Solomon's temple, who remembered the stories of its glory looked back and wept because the second temple was not at all comparable to Solomon's temple. And then we have Herod's temple, which was built in the time of Jesus, and that would be destroyed as well. And it seems almost as if Herod was trying to match Solomon's efforts. This was a very elaborate building, very elaborate structure. But again, we talk about Solomon's temple and Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple. But there's a fourth temple, and that's Ezekiel's temple. And if you have the opportunity, just turn to Ezekiel and read the description of that temple and its location. This is a temple that is yet to come. This will be in the last days. And again, we have this place where the presence of God is manifested. But we also see that these temples did fulfill their purpose in their time. But now, now that the final sacrifice has been made, now that Christ has shed his blood to pay for our sins, God dwells within those who have received him as Lord and Savior. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Several representations here. First of all, we are fellow citizens with the saints, and we are members of the household of God. This is a picture of family, and we talk about being the family of God. There's also the image, and we saw this in Peter, of the living stones being built on Christ, the cornerstone, being built up into a temple of the Lord. And so we have multiple images We have also the picture of the body of Christ, and we are individually members of that body, and Christ is the head. And in all of those contexts, we have this. We do not come to church to meet 
with God the way the Jews came to the temple to meet with him. We come together as the church because Christ has made us a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Again, people today often think of this building as the church, but in point of fact, the word church is the Greek word ekklesia, which actually means an assembly or a gathering of people. We are the church. Part of the church met this morning at 9 o'clock, and I got to see them. Now part of the church is meeting here, and we get to see you. And it's going to be a while before we can relax all of these restrictions and finally come together all at one time as the body of Christ, because we are the church. Every believer is a member of the body of Christ. Each one of us is indwelt by the Holy Spirit from the moment that we receive him as Lord and Savior. But what has been missing in these past three months is the us in let us go into the house of the Lord. As a local church, the body of Christ, we have, in a sense, been dismembered for a while. And today, we're beginning to assemble together again. We're looking forward to the time when we can relax all of these limitations and be together as a complete body. It's no fault or desire of our own. We've been compelled to suspend the services and activities for health reasons that have been obvious to all of us. And in that time, we found it necessary to develop a number of new skills to continue ministry in different ways, and particularly for this old dog, to learn new ways to do things. I never made a video before this all happened, and I understand I look fat online. Thank you for the person who told me that. Um, But in addition to developing new skills and learning new ways to do things, uh, we've also had an opportunity to consider the importance of gathering here together. And we would have never had that opportunity if this had not happened, if we had not had to, in a sense, close down. Now, when I say close down, it's our worship services that have closed down, our educational area that has been closed down. We've been here in the offices all through this time. Uh, Jane continuing to pay the bills and take care of all of that part of thing. Uh, Gail, as you sent your envelopes in, tallying up the offerings and making those deposits. Kim editing the videos and making them look, making us look better than we are actually. Uh, John's been coming in. He would, he has played the piano, and then someone else has gotten together with the music that he played, and then they've sung, and then those two have been brought together, and when you looked at them, you thought they did it all at once, but not necessarily. So there's a lot that's been going on and happening here, but this is the first week that we're back together here in the sanctuary. Now, there's not the most ideal circumstances, but we're looking forward to the changes that will be coming in the weeks ahead. And it's an opportunity for us to appreciate the things that have been part of our worship services for so long, in fact, perhaps long enough for us to be so used to them that we take them for granted. For example, we who are here in the service this morning get to see people that haven't been here for three months. And Even though others were here for the 9 o'clock service, it's going to be weeks before we can meet together again. You've been blessed by special music that have been part of the online services, and we had special music this morning, but we're not singing this morning. That's something that will be worked back into the service. I'm looking forward to us singing the hymns of the faith again. And we're abiding by the guidelines. My understanding is that I project the moisture modules, molecules, molecules, six times further if I'm singing, probably four times when I'm speaking, than if I'm just wearing my mask. So we're taking consideration of that. 
but I'm looking forward to us singing again. And that may come sooner than we had anticipated. And as good as it is to see you this morning, I know that I'm not the only one looking forward to smiles. Now, in our earlier service, we had two individuals that wore masks through the service, and it's up to you. Once you are in your seat, the only thing we ask, don't turn around and speak towards somebody else because that's, that's where we pass this thing along. But it's good to see you, and we wave at one another. We've done elbow bumps this morning. Um, no handshakes, not yet. No holy hugs, not yet. Those will come. That'll have to wait. But we are starting up again. And some of the things that we have done in the interim are going to continue. I believe you're going to continue to see some blogs and other things that are online as part of the ongoing ministry. But coming back to our text this morning, Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the word. The word glad is a Hebrew word, samah. And it means to rejoice, to be filled with joy, to be exceedingly glad. Now, it differs from some of the other words in the Old Testament that are translated glad or gladness or joy. Uh, It is found most often in the Psalms, and it's in the context of the heart and the soul. Samah represents a deep and satisfying joy that encompasses the entire being, but especially the soul, and the spirit. Now, a number of weeks ago, uh, I gave a message, and we talked about a different kind of joy, and that's that leaping joy, and I tried to do that a little bit gracefully when we had that message. This is a different type of joy. This is not that mirth. It's not celebration. This is a deep, residing joy, and it's associated with things like weddings, the birth of children in the Old Testament, especially the birth of a male child, also the anointing of kings, the celebration of the feasts and the holy days of Israel. Sama speaks of a contentment that proclaims, and this is my slant on it, it is well with my soul. I think most of you know the story of that hymn, uh, and I'm not going to go into it uh, this morning, but there is this sense that God has everything under control. And there's a gladness. Again, I'm glad that you're here this morning. I'm glad you've chosen to come out and be part of the fellowship. I know it'd be easier to stay home, your hair in curlers, your bunny sneakers and your nightgown on, your cup of coffee, your tea at your side. Uh, I said I attributed a picture to Kim, but actually it's on Gail's door. And it's rather interesting. If you get the chance to take a look at it, I think you'll enjoy it. Maybe we can get Gail to post that online for you. Um, And that was comfortable, and we made it work. We didn't just shut down. But we could not enjoy the fellowship. And this is what we've been looking forward to. And in the weeks to come, as more and more things pass by the wayside, we're going to be able to express that fellowship in ways that we're still not quite ready for. But in any case, it's good that you're here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Now, Paul speaks to this over in Hebrews chapter 10, in verses 23 through 25. This is sometimes called the pastor's passage, or the pastored verse, because it talks about the assembling together of ourselves. But I want you to follow along as I read verses 23 through 25, because of the points that Paul makes here. First of all, he says in verse 23, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. 
We've not been together, but the Word has been online, and you have the Word. Bibles, I don't know how many Bibles we all have corporately here, if you think about it. If the, it'd be nice to through that sometime. We'll have to find out how many Bibles every person in the church owns, and tally that up and see how many we actually have. I have an entire shelf that is nothing but Bibles. And then I have more Bibles on my computer. But holding fast the confession of our hope, manifesting our faith in our day-to-day lives, it's been difficult for three months. Go to the grocery store. I remember when this aisle goes this way and that aisle comes that way. No, you can't go down that aisle. You have to go down this aisle. Come back up that aisle. You know what a pain it is when what you want is about two steps inside the aisle the wrong way? And we're wearing masks and all of these things. But you know, we've gone from red to yellow, and now that we're in the green, people are actually abandoning a lot of the uh, safety precautions that still need to be taken. So on our part as believers, we want to continue to do that and to be the person who perhaps allows that person to get through. I've, I've never gone for the last can of beans or the last can of corn. Green Giant, super sweet, actually. Haven't seen that in weeks on a store shelf. Not in weeks. I was beginning to worry about Bush's baked beans, but then this week I saw just row upon row of Bush's baked beans this year. But considering one another, holding fast our confession of faith, considering one another with a purpose to stir up love and good works. It's an interesting word, to stir up. I read an an article a number of years ago, and I should have looked it up to share it with you. But the point is that we can just pass by, walk past one another, just follow the aisle, and not really be concerned about other people. One of the things Paul talks about here is considering one another, and that's part of our time of fellowship together, coming together in the church, pardon me, uh, is actually to encourage one another, uh, to, to edify one another. These are things that are important to us. And then the preacher's verse not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. You could have stayed home, but you came out, and we're so glad you're here. And finally, Paul says, exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Exhorting, encouraging, provoking, if you will, is a stronger translation for it, encouraging one another to be the people we ought to be and to do the things that we ought to do, to be those examples for Christ day to day in this world while we're still working through the process. But there's another aspect to that because Paul talks about exhorting one another and then he says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now we've come through three months of this. I don't know, don't pretend to know how long it's going to be until we return to quote-unquote normal. I keep seeing the phrase, the new normal. Uh, I don't know, I was fine with the old normal, but uh, that's another thing entirely. Uh, We need to remember that although this is continuing on and we will be in this process of getting back into church and everything being restored, our education program, starting Sunday school back up again and our other services, all of that, while these days are passing one after another, one thing we need to remember is that the day is approaching, the day when the trumpet is going to sound. The day is coming when, in point of fact, the angel is going to shout. The day is coming when the Lord is going to call us up out of this world. And while we would love to be with him now, I've reconciled myself to the fact that every day that we are here, 
every day beyond the day I'd like to be home with the Lord is another day to share the gospel. The Bible says the Lord is not slack as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, when Pastor Jeff opened the service, he mentioned a, a new track that's available. It's very timely. It's geared to the coronavirus, and it does, in fact, talk about true healing. And so we encourage you, pick up a few of those. Take them with you. Give them out. Now, while people are thinking about this, is the opportunity that we have to share. Now is the time that we can be gracious and have an impact. Now is the time when we can step aside, perhaps, for that last jar of sauerkraut, uh, because only, only, which is it? I forget. Silver floss. There is no sauerkraut but silver floss. I don't know what that other stuff is, but silver floss is the good sauerkraut. Would you give up the last, I mean, this is a question you asked my wife, would you give up the last can of silver floss sauerkraut? Things aren't what they were. We're living in a new normal. But the truth is, for believers, it doesn't matter what the circumstances are. It doesn't matter what normal is. We are who we are. We belong to the Lord. We're his people. And this is an opportunity for us to share Christ. I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a word of prayer. And then uh, I have a few things to share with you, and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we're able to gather together again. And we pray, Lord, that you will keep us safe, keep us healthy, help us to exercise due diligence, Father, in the uh, restrictions that, that still exist. Remind us, Father, to be concerned for the well-being of others as well as ourselves. And we pray as we go forth that you will bless us and help us, Lord God, to be a blessing to others as we share Christ in word and deed. In his name we pray. Amen.